All right, everybody. Welcome to the first episode of the Vintage Spotlight Podcast. This is a new podcast. It's a spinoff from the segment of the same name from Sports Cards Live, where Leighton Sheldon has been joining myself, Jeremy Lee, for over a year and a half on my Saturday night live stream, where he's come on and we've talked vintage sports cards during the episode. Leighton, really excited for this. How are you feeling about our new podcast? I'm very excited, Jeremy. Thanks for having me. And really, this is going to be a wonderful journey. I'm excited. You say thanks for having me. I'm thanking you as well. This is a two-person podcast. This is the Vintage Spotlight, everybody. Our intentions with this podcast are to record every second week or so. We want to get comfortable with this, and we want to bring you guys quality content that you can be entertained, you can be educated, you can be inspired, and you feel something familiar every time you tune in with us. Leighton is the owner of Just Collect and Vintage Breaks, and I am the host of Sports Cards Live. Also, I want to let everybody know, this podcast is available on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and wherever you get your podcasts. Please subscribe, leave a review, and a rating. We would greatly appreciate it, especially as we kick off our new podcast endeavors here. Leighton, one of the things we did in preparing for the episode and for, for the podcast itself was come up with what are the things that we're going to want to hit on each episode. And what we've decided is that we we put together a list of about seven different topics or segments that we can cover each time. But we're giving ourselves the freedom not to have to go into each and every one of them. So today on episode number one, this inaugural episode of the Vintage Spotlight podcast, we are going to hit on bullet number one, key sales. Layton's going to bring us a key vintage card that was sold at auction. Then we're going to dive into the set that that card is from. That's going to be segment number two. The third one, trends and observations, things going on in the hobby, in the vintage world that we think are important that you want to know about. Then we got fresh takes. Fresh takes is a segment where Leighton or myself, or maybe both of us are going to come to you with a take that we have on the hobby. Maybe it's a hot take, maybe it's a fresh take, but it will be a take nonetheless. Number five, fresh to market, Leighton. This is going to be new collections that have been unveiled, recently discovered maybe by Leighton himself and his treasure hunting ex extravaganzas or just elsewhere as well. We want to bring you and let keep you advised of what is fresh to the market. And then we got the collector spotlight. We're going to bring you a collector and something about that person, why they collect vintage, what they collect. And finally, we want your questions, guys. Feel free to send us listener questions and we will incorporate a few of them into our future episodes. Leighton, is that how you see this thing unfolding? You nailed it. All right. You nailed it. Awesome. And you know, it's funny because I, I thank you for having me because I'm so used to thanking you for the last year and a half on Saturday Night Sports Cards Live. I'll just say uh, we both have worked hard to make this happen. And uh, we hope that we're going to provide to you, the listener, an experience, whether it be you're just totally beginner or you're on the flip side and you are an expert in vintage cards. We want to make sure that we are must-see viewing vintage TV for you every couple of weeks. Yeah, well said. Certainly agree with that. I, you, know, you have been thanking me for a year and a half, but this is... This is a partnership. This is a brand new podcast. We have two co-pilots here. And uh, I thank you for partnering with me on this, Leighton. I'm excited. So let's jump right in to our first segment of the show, which is key sales. And Leighton, you've sent me a sale that you think is really interesting. So I'm going to share it on our screen. And by the way, this podcast, the video version, we will, will be available on the Sports Cards Live YouTube channel. Leighton, what YouTube channel will you have it on? It will also be on the Just Collect, one word, YouTube channel as well. Just Collect, and finally, a brand new YouTube channel called Vintage Spotlight. So we're going to come at you from all angles at the beginning, and we'll see how that goes. But with today's first inaugural episode, Key Sales, Leighton, I'm going to share my screen, and I want you to talk about and explain what it is about this sale on Robert Edward Auctions that took place uh, just last month. What is the sale, and why is it important? Sure. So first of all, everyone, whether it be you've been in the hobby for a little bit of time or a lot of time, have likely heard of the three most iconic baseball card sets ever made. And those are the T206 set, the 1933 Gaudi set, 
and the 1952 top set. So this particular example is from the T206 set. These cards were produced roughly from 1909 to 1911. And the reason why I chose this vintage spotlight example from a recent REA auction to discuss is because, believe it or not, I had the chance to buy this card just a few weeks prior to it being placed in the REA auction. So if you rewind just a few weeks ago, I was at the Strongsville, Ohio show. And my company, Just Collect, was not set up. But in fact, that allowed me even more flexibility to treasure hunt walking around the convention. I did some interviews with the likes of Mike Hefner from Leland's and with Gary, uh, who's a longtime collector since the 1970s, and had a lot of fun. But you could imagine, as I'm shopping up and down the aisles, I see a particular dealer by the name of Brian Deck. And Brian normally has usually high-end autographs and memorabilia. Sometimes we'll have cards. This is a reason why when you go to a convention, you should look at every booth and everything they have at the booth because you just never know. So I found the card at the show, and the way that Brian made it seem to me was it was for sale. I didn't realize that it wasn't Brian's. I didn't understand at the time it actually belonged to a client of Brian's. And so we didn't reach a deal on the card itself, but we were close. And if you take a look at the card, even though it's graded just a 1.5 by PSA, the eye appeal, which is something we're going to touch upon later in this episode, is really quite tremendous for a card that stands at a 1.5 on a scale of 110. And I'll add to it with the rare back being the Uzit back, which is one of the top three most extremely rare backs in the T206 set. It's actually an extremely clean back. There's no damage. There's no paper loss. And as Jeremy is showing it off, believe me, I was very close to buying it. So the card then was forgotten about by yours truly. And believe it or not, I'm having a call with Brian Dwyer fairly recently before this auction started. And for those that don't know Brian Dwyer, he's one of the best guys in the hobby. He also happens to be uh, the owner and the president of REA Auctions. And so Brian said, hey, Lee, remember that card you mentioned to me? You're asking me what you thought it was worth just a few weeks back, the T206 Thai Cobb with an Uzid back? I said, of course, how can I forget it? I was trying to, to buy it. He said, well, you wouldn't believe it. But Brian didn't own the card. It was actually on consignment with him from the collector that bought it from REA, that's right, in 2019. And when they bought it in 2019, they paid $38,400 for it. So if you look what it just sold for uh, about a month ago or so with the buyer's premium, it sold for about 54000 So for those that are wondering what I was offered the card for, they told me they, meaning Brian and or the collector, because I'm not sure exactly who had uh, been you know, dictating the price at that point, but they told me $50,000 would be the price. I thought maybe I'd be able to get a little bit cheaper. But after talking to Brian, Brian had told me he thought it was in the $50,000 range. And so... Not only was Brian just dead on accurate, but I was, of course, very interested in following the auction to see what it would sell for. And when it sold in the end, do I have a little bit of buyer's remorse and that I didn't get it? Yes. But I will tell you that the reason why I personally refrain from buying it is because I'm going to try to buy a higher grade example of a rare cop in the T206 set. But as we're going to talk about a little bit later in this episode, Eye appeal is so important as we're showing it off on the screen here. The eye appeal of this card is really having me have some buyer's remorse that I didn't get this card. And in just a minute or two, we're also going to talk about that in the T206 set, that beyond the Uzit back, there's 15 other backs. And that's not counting the 17th back, which is actually the T206 Thai Cobb with its Thai Cobb back. And there was a famous find called the Lucky Seven just a few years ago, which we'll cover, I'm sure. In a future episode of the Vintage Spotlight. And the reason why I wanted to highlight this particular example is because, Jeremy, it's not often that you can literally trace the card when it was last bought, which was approximately five years ago, for X, and it was sold in the exact same auction. So my takeaway was, wow, the market, even for super duper rare cars that maybe don't trade as much, it's still as strong as ever seeing that appreciation. What are some of your thoughts on it? Yeah, I mean, first of all, I agree with you. Looking at that card, 
the eye appeal is really, really nice. The back was was amazing. Yes, it's got the rounded corners with some fray. I like that on my vintage. I like my vintage to look like somewhat look its age. The image of Ty Cobb, uh, bad off shoulder, beautiful, really, really nice. And you know, you did mention that you said you know the three kind of big sets: the T two hundred six, the thirty three Gaudi, and the fifty two tops. You didn't mention the forty eight Leaf, which I think is a a great set as well. And we could save it for a future episode. But I just want to know: would, would that forty eight Leaf be the fourth set in terms of importance, in your opinion? You know, I'm going to punt for now. I'm going to think about it because I, I take these decisions very, very seriously. And I'll tell you, the forty eight Leaf set is a monster. But one of the reasons why collectors and investors alike, Jeremy, have refrained from that set as a completed set, and they really just go after either the Jackie or the Satchel page, is because that set is filled with short prints that are not only difficult to find, but when you find them in low grades, they cost hundreds of dollars, if not, or more per card. That's if you can find them. But it's a great question. I'm going to ponder that for the next episode, and I'll come back to you with my thoughts. One of the things about the T206 set that I find fascinating is the variety of the backs. You alluded to the Uzit on the Ty Cobb that we just talked about. I have a friend who collects the Polar Bears. I've always thought the Sweet Caps or the Piedmonts would be kind of up my alley because they're more plentiful. You've provided me with a list of all these different backs. I'm going to share that on the screen now. So anybody listening, you might want to, you can check out the video, but Layton's going to take us through this as best he can and help us understand uh, what we're calling and, and what this article where it came from called the survival range. And I think to me, it, it actually outlines somewhat of the availability, the different levels of availability of all these backs. So Layton, let's have a look at that right now. Here's the image for those watching. And if you're listening again, try to follow along with Layton, but Layton, take us through these because there's some on here that I've never even heard of. And then I, of course, see the Piedmonts and the Sweet Caporals have the biggest number. So what we're looking at here, everybody, is a list of all the backs on the left side and then an estimate of, I believe it's how many exist, Layton. Is that right? The, how many survived from 1909 to 1911 through until the 2020s? We have a low and a high column reminiscent of the old Beckett magazines. Totally. No one can, we, we can't hone in on the exact number that are still survived and that are out there. So, Leighton, over to you. Take us through this and some of these seriously rare backs. Absolutely. So, first thing is I want to give a shout out to PSA. You can reference this particular article. Uh, we'll try to list it in the video at psacard.com. So, what I really liked about this, Jeremy, it's clearly there was a lot of time put into this based on the existing population of the cards from the T206 set that have already been graded by PSA. And they deduced from there how many cards, according to the back, that they think survived from a little bit over 100 years ago. And so the list that we have on the screen is in order of alphabetical. It is not in order of difficulty. So I'm going to go through... And I'm going to do it according to the list that's there. Um, but make no mistake, it is not an order of difficulty. So one of my favorite backs in the set is the American Beauty. And the reason why for me, on top of like, I like the way that it looks on the back of the card, like the way American Beauty is written, is that if you said to me I was going to produce a short film about Tito Sixes, other than calling it the monster or the chase of a monster, which the Tito Six set is affectionately known as, I would call it the T206 set, the tale of an American beauty. And I could see you smiling, Jeremy. I'm not a film producer, but I can come up with a catchy name or two every now and then. And so the interesting thing about the American beauty backs is they actually run, the dimensions of the card are actually just a little bit smaller than the other cards in the T206 set. And the reason is, is because the packs of cigarettes that the American Beauty brand came in were just a little bit more narrow. And that is just one of those little nuances of collecting, Jeremy, where if you're just a beginner and you've tuned into the Vintage Spotlight for the first time and you haven't thought about your card collection in 10, 20 years or more, and you're like, you know, I remember T206s as a kid, but I never knew that. This is what the Vintage Spotlight's about. We want to have some fun. We want to offer up some expertise that we may have. And to be clear, if you're out there as a T206 expert 
and you have a little bit of a nugget of information, we'd love to hear from you either in the comments section. You could DM Jeremy or I anytime on IG or email direct. We'd love to hear from you. So to get back to center, the next back on the list is the broadleaf. Now, the broadleaf is one of the most difficult in the set. But what I find interesting, just I'm going to look at the low column for now, is that as rare as the broadleaf is, I always thought the American Beauty was just that much more common. Well, this is saying that the American Beauty only has about four times as many cards. And while at first glance, 3,000 more cards might seem like a lot to you or I, Jeremy, think about that there's 500 cards in the set. And of course, that not every card is produced with every back. But the point being is when you divide the sheer number of cards that are in the set for that back, divided by how many may have survived, you can now start to think about, I'm getting goosebumps as I contemplate it, each example of even an American Beauty, which 4,000 cards sounds like a lot, but yet when you divide it up amongst the amount of cards in the set, getting a Hall of Famer may not be as easy as you think, and that's why these cards, Jeremy, bring some big money. Yeah, it makes makes a lot of sense. And I mean, these numbers are really interesting, especially as you you look at some of these that are where the low is under a thousand. And the you know, there there's a grouping. You've got the the zero to to ten to zero to a thousand, you got the thousand to ten thousand, you got everything above, and you got a couple where the low is in the hundreds of thousands, the Piedmonts and the sweet cap. So without going through each back on the list, Leighton, could you highlight or maybe just you know for for the T206 amateur, including myself right now, you know, what can you expect to find at card shows? What, you know, are you, are you going to mostly find Piedmonts and sweet caps? Is it a big deal to find an old mill or a polar bear or a sovereign? I mean, those ones are showing like 20,000 on, on the lows. What, what's your experience there between the rest of these? And then you, and you know, I want to hear that, but then you've got the Ty Cobb back where there's only uh, between 12 and 18 that exist. That was a specific find. And of course the Uzits 200 to 300, but can you summarize kind of how you look at this in the aggregate? Yes. Uh, great question, Jeremy. So in terms of the most rare, I'm going to put aside the Thai Cobb for a minute because I feel like we could take a whole episode even debating, is it actually a T206? Because there's some debate. Is it even a T206? So make sure you follow the Vintage Spotlight for future episodes. So the other three most rare backs, excuse me, the other two most rare backs besides the Uzit is the drum back and the Lennox back. And what's interesting about the Lennox back is it comes in both a brown and a black. And if you look at the pop report in terms of what they're estimating that may have survived, the Uzit population of only two to 300 cards, meaning how many Thai cobs can there actually be out there? In terms of the Lennox back, there's between four and 600. But to, to be clear, those cards, even commons, are going to cost you a lot of money. So on the flip side, what's so wonderful, in my opinion, about the T206 set, you can get into the set for less than 100 bucks by buying a couple commons of Sweet Cap or a Piedmont. And another, I guess, little thing that I figured out many years ago, to be fair, Jeremy, when prices were a little bit cheaper on the rare backs. This is an exercise. We didn't talk about this pre-show. But I encourage everyone and anyone, whether it be from a novice all the way to the most serious collector investor, if you're going to buy a Tito 6, for example, of Walter Johnson's portrait, and let's just say a poor version cost you, oh, I don't know, 2000 bucks, give or take. I always try to look, keep in mind that a polar bear and sovereign, according to this, they're not rare, but yet compared to a Piedmont or a Sweet Cap, they're much more difficult to find. So what I started doing many years ago, probably about 15 years ago, when I started to collect some T206s for myself, anytime I would, and I only um, buy Hall of Famers, anytime, Jeremy, I would buy Hall of Famer, I always looked at the next most rare back and what it would cost me. And I'm no mathematical genius, that is for sure. But I would see some very obvious examples that would stick out and said, you know what? That example with the old mill back is worth only a 20% premium because I think it's infinitely more difficult to find than one of the sweet caps or the Piedmonts. So that's what's kind of fun as you look at this data. And as you said, we're not going to go through every one of them, but I think in terms of this list, some of the backs that represent the best value that are super difficult to find, but are just easy enough 
and you may not break the bank. So you're, I already talked about my love for American beauties. In terms of rarity, Hindus are pretty tough to find. Now, the prices are pretty healthy on those. But, if, for example, if you look at Tolstoy, Tolstoy's only have a 1,000 more examples on the low end. But yet Tolstoy's are far more affordable than a Hindu back. So it's just something to keep in mind. This list you might want to keep as like a screenshot if you're going to go to the National Sports Collectors Convention in Cleveland this year. Because if you're going to go after, let's say, like a T206, Clark Griffith, or John McGraw, which is more of like a middle-of-the-road Hall of Famer, I personally would want to know if I was going to buy, let's say, a $500 example of those, well, what will the next most rare back maybe set me back? And to me, the investment appeal of those, as well as the collectability, is so much greater. And you don't have to take my word for it. Just look at this chart. Some of these are really tough to find. But I would hone in on what I just said, which is the Tolstoy and the El Principe de Gallus, because I feel like in that four to 5,000 range, they are definitely easier to find than like the cycle, which lists at 4,000 on the low end, or uh, the Hindu, and you're not going to break the bank on those. So you've got, so those are one degree of rarity. Then the next degree of rarity are more common, I should say. You got the old mills, the polar bears, and the sovereigns. I could see people focusing on those three. And then you've got the Piedmonts and the sweet caps where you're going to get in most affordable and have the most different, uh, the most amount of options to select from the cards as well. Uh, the total, the total of all of these columns, you have 688,000 on the low to 1.286, 1.286 million on the high. Final question I have, Leighton, on this is, does every player have every back? No, it's a great question. So Tito Sixes were not only produced with these 16 backs, they were produced in three different series, and not every player has every back made. But this is what's interesting, and a lot of folks don't know this fact, and then we'll move on to eye appeal. So the T206 set is called the monster, not because of the 524 cards. You might be thinking, like, I don't really quite understand, Layton. Here's the deal. If you thought about and considered and contemplated, because people have, how many player and back combinations are there in the set? There are well over 5,000 combos of the T206 fronts, and the backs. And so to this day, no matter the riches you may possess, there is not a single person in the world that is known to have a complete T206 master set with every player front and every player back, but that doesn't mean that people aren't trying. Right on. Yeah, that's that's why they call it the monster, right? So pretty, uh, yeah, really cool stuff there. That, 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 that right there, you you could have a university course on the T206 set, and uh, I don't know that that would be a one-semester sort of course even. <laughs> There's lots there. All right, let's move along to the next uh, segment of the show, which we – let's – actually, we're going to skip trends and observations, come back to it. We got some cool stuff to talk about that. Hint, Josh Gibson. But let's talk about – a little bit about eye appeal. And it's so important in the hobby – as you know, it's been important for a while, but it's becoming more and more important as time goes by and as collectors become more experienced and more seasoned. And you you provided a great example here, Leighton. I'm going to bring it up on the screen right now. Two 1952 tops Mickey Mantle cards. I noticed I didn't say rookie card because this is his first tops card. We have on this image that is now on the screen, on the left-hand side, we have a PSA 2 good copy. And we see a price tag of $75,000. You took the uh, pictures of this at the card show, at the Philly show. And on the right, we have a PSA 4 VG to X priced at $105,000. Now, I'm just going to do a couple of uh, X, uh, of description type of comments on these cards. The one on the left, the PSA 2, is better centered than the card on the right. The card on the right is shifted to the right of the cardboard canvas, where the card on the left appears to be almost perfectly centered, if not perfect. It does have some corner issues that the card on the right doesn't have, as well as some surface issues that the card on the right doesn't have. The card on the right, of course, being the higher graded card priced in this vendor showcase at $30,000 more. Now, Leighton, I want you to just tell us a little bit about the conversation you had with the vendor about these two cards and what, what you guys thought about them. 
Sure. So his name is Brad from Desert Ice Sports. And Brad and I have known each other for a while. We've done a lot of business together. And it was one of those, I think it was like a Saturday or Sunday. And I finally had a chance to step away from the booth. I might have even had my uh, music on so I could really focus on trying to buy. And I came across these two cards, these 252 tops mantles. And when I quickly realized I wasn't going to be able to buy either one of them, I'm like, wow, I'm just curious, Brad, because they were literally right next to each other. Which one would you rather have? Got to remember, folks, I'm a baseball card nerd. So I was curious what Brad thought. And then even though him and I both agreed, I asked him if he minded if I took a photo of them and I was going to post it on my IG account, which you could find me at Leighton underscore Sheldon on Instagram. And I not only posted it, but I was curious, generally curious what people thought. And even though, of course, as we know, with the way I appeal and centering has become so important in the hobby, Jeremy, over the last you know number of years, there was still a number of people that would prefer the four, even though it was $30,000 more, and their general reasoning was a combination of, hey, I like the surface a lot better, and I want the higher grade. And to me, this is what the whole expression that beauty is in the eye of the beholder is all about. So there really isn't a right or wrong. And if you wanted my opinion, I personally would take the well-centered copy. But the reason why I would take the PSA 2 isn't just because it's $30,000 cheaper. Jeremy, you can attest to this as well as anyone who's been in the hobby for as long as we both have. This particular card, the 1952 Topps Mickey Mantle, is really difficult to find well-centered. There's other cards from the same time period that are not nearly as difficult to find with really good centering. But this card in particular, people have studied, they're saving every well-centered example they've ever seen on the internet. And there's a lot of fun stuff about the 1952 Topps Mickey Mantle. So Jeremy, I ask you, of these two, keeping in mind the four is $30,000 more, budget considered, which one would you rather have? <laughs> yeah, it's, so it's a great question. These are two great cards. And this is where, you know, I'm, I understand that centering to the greater hobby is the most important of all the criteria that go into grading or assessing the condition of a card. Now, I actually personally, I, I think centering is super important and I am more attracted, of, of course, to a, a, a well-centered card or a better centered card. However, I put heavy weight, heavier than most collectors do, I think, on the surface registration and the surface itself, surface wear, boldness of color. In this case, the card on the left, the PSA 2, has surface issues. You see a bit of a, a light snow effect on, on Mickey's cheek. You see it in the background blue, whereas in the PSA 4, it's a beautiful portrait. The, the image is beautiful. The color is strong. There's no snow effect or, or very, very minor. So, you know, for me, I, in this case, would actually be willing to sacrifice the centering for what I deem to be the better image of Mickey Mantle of the card design overall. Now, if the surface of the two was stronger, I would lean more towards the two. The two has, it looks like it even has maybe some, I don't know if that's paper loss on the bottom right corner, but that's a pretty messed up bottom right corner. The top left corner is also pretty messed up. Those don't bother me, Leighton, nearly as much as the surface wear bothers me. Sure. I don't mind rounded corners. I don't mind ding corners. I don't even mind light creasing. Those all take a back seat to me to color, surface, lack of surface wear, and overall focus or registration. So in this case, I do think I like the four better, but I got to give props where it's due and say that this PSA 2 good copy has amazing centering. And for the people who are all about centering, I completely understand why they would choose that one over the four and have $30,000 left in their pocket as a bonus too. Right? So I was going to pose this to you, Jeremy. So imagine we're at the national and, you know, and obviously this is all imaginary because we're not just throwing around uh, dollars like this, but imagine you're like, all right, so late I'm going to buy this. You know where you would get jealous, Jeremy. I now have my two and you'd be thrilled with your four. But I would be taking video and I would say, Jeremy, look at one of these great cards I just bought with a $30,000 I just saved buying this PSA 2. And this is where I appreciate you smiling, but this is where my collecting mind runs because I don't have an infinite budget. 
You don't have an infinite budget. So it's an interesting question. We're not buying either card. Um, and there really isn't a right or wrong answer. Um, and I remember seeing the cards in person. Jeremy, you are right. The surface on the four wouldn't look out of place as a surface on an eight card. Whereas the two, as well-centered as it is, it's a little bit dull. The color's a little off. Um, and maybe part of me is like, you know, but investment, I think I can flip the centered one because they're so much tougher. It's hard to give, uh, you know, um, an answer that's not somehow influenced by what I like as a collector. Right. Exactly. I think that 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 PSA two version is a great inventory card. For me, as far as my personal collection goes, I wouldn't be happy with it because of that surface, whereas the four I would be despite the fact that it's off-centered. Okay, let's move along. Let's go now to what we're calling Trends and Observations. It's a, another segment of the show that we're going to hit on as often as we can, as often as we have something worthy to talk about. And Leighton, again, you came with this one to our inaugural episode today, and this has to do with Josh Gibson and more from a macro perspective, the recent announcement by Baseball Hall of Fame or, or baseball, the, 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 the powers that be, that the stats from the old Negro Leagues are now going to be incorporated with Major League Baseball. And what does that mean for some players from the Negro Leagues that never played in the majors? Uh, how are they going to be looked at now by the collecting public? And some things that come to mind for me, Leighton, uh, maybe that, you know, First of all, nothing has changed about the player's career. Nothing has changed about those players' cards or memorabilia. The only thing that's changed is that somebody or a committee in 2024 decided to combine the stats of the two leagues. That's all that has changed, but that is enough in our hobby to, to move the needle as far as values go. And one of the things that I think is going to drive some of this potential value is going to be the fact that new items are going to be added to various set checklists on the PSA set registry. The PSA set registry being one of the most influential forces in our hobby of value for cards. So Leighton, why don't you tell us a little bit about you? Well, first of all, your thoughts on all this, and then we'll get into a couple of Josh Gibson items that actually show what, what might be a reflection of this change in direction by Major League Baseball? Yeah, it's uh, really exciting for a lot of people in the hobby. And Jeremy, I think you nailed it. There is a lot of people who are in the collecting baseball card hobby that decide what they collect based on what happens with the Major League Baseball Hall of Fame. So as Jeremy just said, the stats are now combined. You now have an all-time hit leader. You have a new all-time this leader. And so that, of course, as Jeremy just said, causes people to have some needs or desires to fill some of the holes on their PSA set registry. And what's interesting with Josh Gibson is it's almost like the perfect storm, Jeremy, because Josh Gibson, you think Shulis Joe Jackson doesn't have many cards? Josh Gibson has even less because he wasn't in the major leagues. And his most desirable and probably valuable card is his 1950-ish Toloteros card. And that card was produced post-career, but yet it brings big money, even in low grades. And that was before this announcement. And I myself, as not only an investor, but also as a collector, I know I was an underbidder on one of those years ago, but the market isn't where it is today. And I feel as though I've lost the opportunity to acquire one. And so you can imagine, Jeremy, what happened for me is I started to think about, can I maybe buy a Josh Gibson photo or a different Josh Gibson card or even an autograph or piece of memorabilia? And so what I quickly found was, for example, I don't know which card you're gonna maybe show first, but like that 1974 La Laughlin card, if I'm saying it right, a PSA H is sold for $3,700. And that card, I'm not exaggerating, five years ago, maybe less, you could have found that card individually at a booth for $25, like ungraded in nice condition. And so just because that card will now be likely part of some sort of baseball hall of fame slash leaders registry on the PSA set registry, you can see it, it did only get one bid, but that card considering where it was just selling a few years ago is selling for a massive premium. Uh, and I just find it fascinating because no offense to that set, but it's like, 
not that great of a card. You know, it's just a, I don't know, a lot of those like Laughlin or, you know, Fleer, those strange sets from the 70s, to some people it's interesting. To others, you know, I just know they collect the cards from those sets if they're a completist of like John McGraw. Well, he's got like a 68 Fleer World Series card. So people get that. But this card really has never been popular. And now all of a sudden, because of the announcement by Major League Baseball, with the inclusion of the Negro League stats into Major League Baseball stats, just this whole explosion of value is happening on Josh Gibson cards and memorabilia. Yeah. So, and, okay. So we saw the card there. We had the Laughlin on the screen and, and that actually, I'm going to go back to it for a moment. You mentioned that it's not the most interesting card and I agree, you know, it's got, it, it really is a one, one ink plate card. It looks like Brown on a tan sort of, or a beige stock. It is pretty cool. Nonetheless, you can, you can see Josh Gibson in it, but it's a, it's as basic as it comes. Then you've got this piece of memorabilia right here. Josh Gibson, single signed baseball here, Leighton. Uh, the autograph isn't even that legible anymore, but you can read it. You can see I'm showing it on the screen right now. This car, this ball is listed on eBay right now for $1 million. It even says one person has it in their cart right now, Leighton. I don't think that's me. But can you just sort of speak to this million dollar asking price? Is this somebody really trying to take advantage of what's going on right now? Or do you think that a million dollars for this ball is reasonable? The description or the, the auction title also says the only Josh Gibson single signed baseball on earth certified by PSA and JSA. So Leighton, what do you think about this piece? Well, it's amazing because Josh Gibson was known to have problems like Sheila Show Jackson, you know, with writing. And there's just simply not a lot of examples around. So on the one hand, the supply is very low and the demand is now much higher, but he's not asking $10,000. He's asking a million dollars. So for a lot of collectors like myself included, I think the ball's amazing, but I can't buy the baseball for a million dollars. But I want to say this. And I'm curious if you agree. I don't know if this baseball will sell or not, sell or not. But I do believe that with the recent news of Josh Gibson and the stats, and with what some of his cards are selling for, because this happens all the time in the auction world, mark my words, you're going to see whether it be a Josh Gibson autograph or two, or some really interesting Josh Gibson memorabilia, it's going to come to market in the next 12 months or so, because the market is red hot. And it is ready to absolutely overbid, if you will. And what I mean, what I mean by overbid is when there is a huge demand that has now been flushed out of nowhere. We didn't talk about this, but there isn't just a PSA registry for cards. There's people who want to have a single signed baseball of every Major League Hall of Famer and or star. And we are talking about there might only be one or a couple autographs of said player in existence. And now their stats are being counted. You can imagine, Jeremy, it's the perfect storm of yeah. items to be selling for record, record prices. Yeah, it, it really is. And uh, I, I'm excited to see what does happen. I will be observing from the sidelines. I don't like to really dip my toes in when the interest is peaking as it is right now. But and again, in my opinion, nothing has changed about in history. The only thing that's changed is the organization of the information and the inclusion of the data. And uh, But that's enough in our hobby. That is enough. Okay. We are excited to bring you guys this inaugural episode of the Vintage Spotlight. In future episodes, we are going to do a collector spotlight where we bring on or we discuss a collector who we are aware of. We want your questions, guys. We want to hear from you. Any questions that you'd like us to address on a future episode, we will bring on one or two questions. Layton, before we do wrap up this episode, I want to—I do want to remind everybody, this show is available on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, wherever you get your podcasts. Please leave a rating, leave a review, uh, and drop a comment. We appreciate all that. Layton, before we sign off, I have one vintage card. I'm going to I'm going to do this every episode. You can too if you want. I'm going to show one vintage card from my collection and I'm going to start with baseball with my oldest card and I'm going to show you guys a 1910 E90-2 American Caramel Honus Wagner. I figured I would never be able to own the T206, the True Grail, the hobby. So I went out about 
11, 12 years ago and purchased this one. I purchased it from REA Auctions, one of their catalog auctions. It's a good PSA 2, beautiful card. I, I, I absolutely love owning it. I don't plan on selling it. Leighton, take us home. Tell us a little bit. Just explain a bit about the difference between, say, this Honus Wagner E90-2 American Caramel versus the T206. Sure. So first of all, great job, Jeremy. Great foresight because the card's hot. That card's on fire. And you, I'm sure you bought it very well if you bought it 11 years ago. Um, so that card is much more part of a regional set as opposed to the T206 set, which was actually issued not only with the 16 different brands, but literally to the tune of millions of cards were made, if not tens of millions, and they were distributed all over our country. So the numbers, and it would have been fun, maybe we'll do that for a future episode or in one of our posts, I bet you the pop report on the E90-2 Honus Wagner is anemic compared to um, just any of the T206s uh, from that time period. And really, uh, I want to commend you, Jeremy, because you just use your common sense. And I think it's sometimes forgotten in our hobby that you're like, you know what? I'm not going to own the Grail, just not going to be possible. It is a, not only a great looking card, you bought yourself a nice, strong eye appeal, low grade example. And you also sat on it, meaning you didn't buy it at the height. I like what you said about the Josh Gibson. You want to wait for the dust to settle. Yeah. So maybe now isn't the time to buy a Honus Wagner because his cards are super hot. So that's another interesting thing that we can discuss on future episodes. And if I may, I want to show off one card as a little bit of a teaser for next episode of the Vintage Spotlight, because this card in particular is not in my collection, although maybe it will be. I just had the good fortune to buy a fresh to the hobby collection of hundreds of T206 cards, T205s, and more. And the story goes like this. This gentleman's mother was an antique collector. She didn't buy anything related to sports, but this gentleman was a baseball aficionado and he loved cards. So his mother comes back one day from doing some shopping in the country. They lived in Atlanta in 1969. And sometime in summer afternoon of 1969, she comes home and she shows her son this collection and he was floored and almost fell over. Well, he's had the cards ever since until late last week we purchased it. This is the first reveal of yet another T206 Hall of Famer from the collection with a rare back. Whew. So you can see that the Matthewson name is a little bit cut off in the bottom. This is the white cat variation. But let me tell you, this is not an easy back to find. Hindu, Hindu Christy Matthewson, T206, white cap. The full story in the video is going to be on our blog in the next few weeks at blog.justcollect.com with the video being on my YouTube channel, Just Collect. But I'm really excited to show off more of these cards on the next episode and tell you the full story. Awesome. All right. Everybody, thank you for joining us for the inaugural episode of the Vintage Spotlight Podcast. We will be back. Give us a couple of weeks. We will bring you more of this type of content. We are excited for the future of the hobby of this podcast of vintage sports cards. We love them. We are we are immersed in them. Leighton, thank you so much. I'm excited for what we are endeavoring upon here. Everybody who, who is still with us listening or watching. Thank you so much for giving us a chance, for giving us some of your precious time today. We are grateful. And with that, this first episode of the Vintage Spotlight podcast is now over. Thank you very much.